good afternoon everyone as promised we are back yet with another interesting episode of expert series my name is anugra william and i welcome you all for today's expert session series on dialysis delivery landscape in india demand challenges and policy insights the burden of kidney failure deaths in india is greater in comparison to other low and middle middle income economies with a similar socio demographic index suggesting an improvement in mortality rates in india is possible even with the existing resources government launched pradhan mantri national dialysis program under national health mission in ppp mode to make renal care services affordable to bpl citizens according to this program data every year 2.2 lakh new patients of erst get added in india resulting in an additional demand for 3.4 crore dialysis annually today we are gathered here to discuss the impact of the program so far the challenges faced by the healthcare industry in bridging the demand supply gap and the way forward in detail i am honored to introduce the experts present here mr vikram bupla founder and ceo of nephroplus dr leftland general as narula principal director kidney and urology institute fortis escorts heart institute mr indranil roy choudhury group ceo apex kidney care and dr ashish sharma medical director prezinius medical care limited not uh, last but not the least a moderator for the session ms shambhavi saran manager tax and economic policy group Anstan Young for this session today. Before I hand it over to the moderator, I would like to make some housekeeping announcements. For the audience who have joined us, please use the Q&A function on the bar at the bottom of your screen to type in the questions. Please also highlight whom you want to address this question to. Now I would like to hand over to Shambhavi. Shambhavi, what do you please? uh thanks anugra you have very succinctly summarized the issue of uh, end stage renal disease in india and the burden that uh, nearly 2.2 additional patients are added every year which leads to a uh, 3.4 crore annual an additional annual uh, dialysis demand so in this context it is necessary to understand the landscape of dialysis in india how we are how we evolved where we are going how has pmndp contributed what is now required going forward as we construct the one nation one dialysis and uh, how do we uh, position india as a as a hub for dialysis in the future so just to start this discussion we will first have initial remarks from all the panelists uh in these in initial remarks we would uh, like to understand the evolution of uh, this treatment in india and where we are at and where we are going uh just to uh, then begin this discussion i would like to invite uh, dr narura uh, to please uh, provide us an overview thank, thank you. you thank you very much it's an honor to be on this panel and to be giving a preamble to what we are going to discuss today now what is so important about dialysis that it has taken so much of time and even caught the attention of the government that we need to provide dialysis to our patients if you look at dialysis it's a remarkable innovation it is the only exception where you can return a patient to full life a healthy life a productive life even if there is an end stage organ failure in any other organ failure the answer is a kidney or kidney or a liver or a heart transplant but here a dialysis works as well if not better than a kidney transplant so we must understand that what happens in the human body there is a constant production of waste which the kidneys throw out so when the kidneys fail the dialysis take over this one important function of waste excretion now this is done intermittently and more importantly it is done repetitively now any function that you do repetitively has got economic implications and health implications and that is why i think we are discussing today that what would be the economic and health implications of a repetitive procedure like dialysis 
the biggest gap that we have whenever we sit for such a symposium or a webinar is lack of reliable data. But from bits and pieces that we have picked up in India and those published from 2016 onwards, like it was introduced, there are about two odd lakh patients who develop end stage kidney disease every year. This was the figure in 2016. And the number of patients who actually enter the dialysis program are about one lakh patients. Now, if you do a mathematical calculation from other countries where and statistics are better, you find that if there was no limitation, about 11 lakh people in 2016 needed dialysis, while those who were actually provided were only 1 lakh. So there's a large gap, and this is an opportunity to a larger population in India. Now let's look at what is the available facilities that we have. In 2016, when we did a study, we found that there were about 12,000 dialysis centers in the cause of lack of reliable dialysis program. They have provided about 1,000 odd dialysis centers with about 7,000 odd machines. So that is the amount of progress in the quantum of dialysis that is taking place in our country. But with quantum comes the responsibility of keeping the quality of dialysis good in all our centers. And I'm sure in this panel we will be discussing on the quality of dialysis, which unfortunately varies from place to place. And the poorer quality is seen in the lower in the smaller towns and smaller cities of our country where the regulations are not strong enough the standing operating procedures are not in place and where people cut on for cost efficiency they cut on what is actually required for a patient and this is worse in rural areas where the infrastructure is not there and there are monetary compulsions so one way forward is from hemodialysis to move to a peritoneal dialysis. And I think that is what the theme of this conference, how to take it to the doorstep of the patient. We have direct transfer of bank accounts. We have Russian at doorstep. And I'm sure we'll find a way to take peritoneal dialysis to the doorsteps of our population. With that, I hand over it back to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Narada. Yes, uh, we'll discuss peritoneal dialysis also um, in this discussion. Uh, but uh, first, coming to hemodialysis and uh, the dialysis that is majorly provided in India right now, I, I would like to hand over to uh, Vikram sir if he could uh, tell us uh, how has India's journey been in providing dialysis services. Thanks, Shambhavi. Thanks for having me on this uh, panel discussion. I think India definitely has come a long way. Uh, we have seen this journey ourselves for the last 12 and a half years uh, since Nephroplus inception. And uh, uh, while we have come a long distance, there is a um, huge amount of uh, improvement that is needed in terms of access and affordability for dialysis in India. The statistics say, still say that only 15% of the patients who require dialysis in India currently are able to access dialysis, right? Uh, I, I want to recall the days in the 60s and 70s when dialysis started. It was only offered in a few institutions like CMC Vellore, PGH Chandigarh, and so on. But we have come a long way. Um, I think the whole access was available primarily in the metro cities, if you look at in the early 2000s. But now, we ourselves as a network, we are present in 175 cities across 25 states. So uh, as an industry, I think the access has improved uh, dramatically. I'm sure uh, at least 75% of the districts in India would have a dialysis center. Quality, as Dr. Narula has mentioned, uh, there's still a long way to go in terms of quality uh, uh, measurement and uh, validation in the tier three, tier four, tier five cities. But at least access has improved dramatically. That's point number one from the evolution of the industry. Point number two is the whole 
uh, movement we see from the private capacity to public private partnership capacity right uh, previously i think there were very few public institutions which were providing dialysis then a lot of private institutions uh, joined hands to uh, to provide access uh, build capacity but then since last about 10 years we have seen indian government especially many state governments using the public private partnership route to provide increased access to dialysis especially for the below poverty line population right um, dialysis as we all know it's a chronic condition weekly three times it's very expensive for patients to uh, pay for it out of pocket so the ppp has given a big boost to the indian dialysis ecosystem and throughout the world we have to note that only governments provide access to dialysis because it's an expensive modality it's not realistic for the private uh, population to pay out of pocket on a long term basis so ppp we have seen fairly active one of the things that we would like to see as an industry is inclusion of quality standards as dr narula has mentioned because uh, if if ppps are purely bid on l1 l2 l3 criteria then we are playing with the lives of the patients we need proper validation of dialysis experience we need proper uh, authentication of whether the service providers have published their outcomes in national and international journals so that the patient lives are in safe hands so the ppp uh, the second point is uh, has provided a big fillip and we hope it will continue to increase further the third thing is i think while um, quality access has increased quality still has a long way to go uh, especially as we discussed in the tier 2 tier 3 cities but we have to uh, be little bit cognizant of the fact that uh, going back to the statistic of 85% of the people who need dialysis are not getting dialysis so if you increase the price point significantly higher with having bells and whistles machines bells and whistles modalities india does not need that at this point of time we need to make sure the affordability aspect is is uh, factored in so that the um, the quality and the cost balancing act has to be performed in an ideal world when budgets are not a constraint we can provide all the bells and whistles right but we have to live uh, in a balanced world where taxpayer money has to be used in the most efficient format um and every country is looking at spending every taxpayer dollar to the best possible impact uh, goal right so i think um we need to be we need to create our own uh, india standards in order to improve the access in order to make sure it's con it continues to be affordable and i think many of the service providers in the industry now have started publishing clinical outcomes so it gives me lot of um, satisfaction if you look at apex if you look at prezinius medical care and all the fortis max medanta all the institutions we publish our outcomes so that gives lot of boost we hope that many of the smaller providers will also start publishing their outcomes uh, going forward to ensure quality and i think one important uh, final thing i would like to say is uh, 12 years back when we started nephroplus um, it's its co-founder is himself on dialysis for 13 years at that time now 25 plus years uh, the the co-founder kamal keeps saying uh, 12 years back dialysis was seen as a death sentence right uh, the nephrologist used to say don't travel anywhere just go to the dialysis center don't drink this don't drink that don't eat that so it was pretty much a death sentence but now with the industry uh, maturing dialysis has become a lifestyle disease right now right uh, the co-founder kamal says it's like going to the gym three times a week you get your blood purified you got to live with your life we ourselves have created a holiday dialysis network with a beach in goa with uh, rishikesh dehradun pilgrimage centers in varanasi tirupati uh, taj mahal to see taj mahal in agra we have created a holiday dialysis network so i think the market has come a long way from a death sentence to you can lead a normal life on dialysis uh, so we need to appreciate that 
Having said that, still a long way to go and a lot more miles to cover. That's it from my side, Shamudu. Uh, thank you, uh, Vikram sir, and uh, you raised a very important point of the fine balance between quality and affordability, and we'll be discussing that also. I'd uh, now like to invite Dr. Sharma to provide his initial remarks. Uh, thanks, Shambhavi, and uh, good evening to everybody, and uh, uh, congratulations for this wonderful um, panel this evening. So I'll start with, I would uh, echo with whatever we uh, narrated by Dr. Narula and uh, Vikram. So for sure, uh, dialysis today has replaced uh, that agony which people used to feel uh, long years back and they used to say that uh, it's a painful thing, it's a, it's a death sentence. And even an example like Vikram gave, gave example of uh, Mr. Kamal who is very well known to me and we talk regularly. Uh, my own mother, she is on dialysis and I'm happy to say that she is much better when I started the dialysis. So I will not say that it's a painful thing. Second on uh, adding to what is required in this country as an ecologist and being a part of uh, an esteemed organization, uh, Physiognomist Medical Care, it's a three points agenda, which is uh, accessibility, availability, and affordability. So it has to be a combination of these three factors. I mean, and, and you can see such a huge country with the, such a huge population, hardly 2,600 or so registered nephrologists. Most of them are in metro cities. So if you take a leap from any metro city and you are left nowhere, and maybe you will find the dialysis centers run by, again, nobody, like Vikram said. So for that, we need a bare minimum standards so that the patients who are getting the treatment, they should also, at least they have the right to get at least a bare minimum quality of the treatment. I mean, otherwise, this dialysis, which is an extremely life-saving procedure, becomes a life-taking procedure and the blame comes on dialysis. Rather, it's not the fault of the dialysis, it's the fault of the people who don't know how to do it and thus being running because there is no standard or mandate till date in this country, but I'm happy to share that I guess uh, Vikram will agree also that we are in a process and government is in the process of doing that and we will be soon seeing that point as well. <clears throat> Next is uh, um, what I say affordability, which also has the, you know, one aspect of technology. I agree again that yes, for uh, a basic level, we need a basic dialysis at least. We don't need a, a kind of a high-end or rocket science. But for that also technology is required. And uh, like our Honorable Prime Minister announced many things, one of them is make in India. That's a perfect thing. And uh, being an Indian, I would be proud of that if my organization also has a manufacturing donate in this country, but that's not an easy job. So that's one point that like Dr. Narula said, and like Vikram said, and everybody knows that dialysis being a life-saving procedure, government should also help uh, the organizations to, you know, kind of uh, give some relaxations on custom duties because this cost of custom duty directly impacts the cost of the treatment. So if the technology becomes costlier, it becomes difficult for a provider to continue to giving the same standard and the same money. I mean, nobody wants to lodge, have a loss and keep on paying from its pocket. It cannot be sustainable. So that's one thing. And next coming on point is some reimbursement. I mean, PPP is a very important aspect for this country. And it actually is the base for the long run future. And if you go to other countries, even neighboring countries, there is a very nice uh, reimbursement coming. And Vikram knows that. Uh, Indranil knows that. So we should have at least, you know, a sustainable reimbursement with the government so that, you know, the providers can sustain that. Along with last but not the least, which I would be very thin, is education. If we need such a huge population of providers, and I will add experienced providers to provide the treatments to the patients, we need a task force. And it's not only the trained nephrologists. It also requires trained doctors, trained nurses, trained technicians. And that to form a recognized, sustainable institute, not anything like which takes the pay person, gives a certificate in six months or nothing without any reliability. 
So we need lots of sustainable, recognized institutes which create this task force. And plus, we need to at least create the concept of dialysis nursing in this country, which is not there. I mean, dialysis nursing, if you go out of the country, it's only dialysis nursing. We don't have dialysis nurses in this country. So, I mean, we have law, everybody of us has, has a pain point as a nephrologist, as a provider, as a manufacturer, everybody has their pain points. But I guess combinedly, whatever we want to do and we have to do is for this country. And uh, when we talk about this country, it's not I, me or you. It's, I guess, we, all of us has to do this thing so that, which I believe all of you will agree, would lead again also in this field also India as a world leader. And uh, I guess that's the vision of our Honorable Prime Minister as well. So that's all from my side. I'll happy to answer. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sharma. You've uh, pointed out so many different aspects of the dialysis ecosystem and all of which are important and need to work together. Uh, to bring in the best quality care in India. Uh, I would now like to request uh, Indrani sir to provide his initial remarks uh, on the dialysis ecosystem in India. Yeah, first of all, uh, thank you, Nakhil, for organizing this. And uh, thank you, Shambhavi from EY for moderating this. I'm privileged to be in the August company of people like uh, Dr. Narula Vikram and Dr. Afish. While uh, all of us have spoken about the evolution, indeed, you know, over the last 15 years, 20 years, this industry has seen significant progress. I mean, Vikram mentioned about dialysis, you know, holidays. There are examples where we run a robust home dialysis program. We have taken dialysis centers to the patient's residence, and that's a very robust program with quality being provided, and many others do that, and nocturnal dialysis and all that. But let's be cognizant of the fact that uh, whatever little epidemiological study we have, it says that India with a population of 140 crore has 20 lakh CKD5 or ESRD patients, out of which Vikram mentioned about 15 odd percent actually only take dialysis, whereas ideally everyone should take. But again, the factors like affordability, accessibility, and all those uh, are a factor. And if we look at the incidence data, whatever is available published in journals like Indian Journal of Nephrology and all, and a very conservative estimate says that uh, with this 2 lakh out of 20 lakh ESRD patients, they take about 2 crore dialysis in the country in a year, all segments, all sectors taken together. In the next five years, this can be anywhere between 4.5 to 5 crore. Now, obviously, as the country is gearing up for this challenge with the PMNDP and private providers moving uh, in the right direction, there are the challenges which need to be taken care of, along with the PMNDP and the program for providing dialysis to the below poverty line patients. Let's not also understand the patients who are in the middle income group. Dialysis cost is a burden for everyone. It's not only for the below poverty line, it's a burden for everyone. So that needs to be looked at, that's point one. The second thing which needs to be looked at is India today has about somewhere between very rough data, uh, 40 to 50,000 dialysis machines across the country. And even if we do a very conservative estimate, a simple maths, saying each machine doing three shifts in a day, 25 working days and 12 months and so on and so forth, the existing capacity is good enough to deliver about four and a half to five crore dialysis in a year, which doesn't happen. One of the factor definitely being that many of the machines, the distribution is, it's highly concentrated towards the urban areas, uh, not so much towards the rural areas. And the other point which I would like to bring in is the patient awareness and education. I mean, India is not <laughs> India is also the interior parts of the states where we find that the patients still are not very clear that uh, you know how dialysis ultimately is going to bring benefit to them. And there they have reservations in traveling to the dialysis centers and taking thrice a week dialysis. Well, uh, all these will remain a challenge while the country gears up to you know expand and ramp up the facility for providing dialysis these are the things needs to be looked at and what i would also say let's not uh, forget the fact that even though it's a life sustaining uh, option because in ckd5 there is only two options either transplant or dialysis 
and given the challenges of transplant, uh, which is uh, and only ninety five percent of the patients have to sustain their life through dialysis. Still today, dialysis machines are imported. They are not made in India. Most of the dialysis consumables are imported, and with that comes the challenge of customs duty and all those. The lack of adequate manpower. And more importantly, Dr. Narula and Vikram we were mentioning, and also Dr. Ashish were mentioning about quality. What I feel the need of the hour is, you know, see today most of the established players they have their own quality protocol. We follow our own quality protocol, whether it is Nephro Plus, Apex, Presnius, anyone. The need is for the government to mandate and ensure that a common minimum program on the quality protocol has to be a must. See today in the pharmaceutical industry, if you see. Someone has to manufacture an ampule of an injection. There are certain basic things that no one can bypass. Unfortunately, there is nothing in dialysis so for so long, and so their industry is highly fragmented with large mom and pop stores who have zero accountability. Our wish, and we sincerely hope that with the large programs like PMNDP coming into the picture, while the government has started talking about quality assessment and quality parameters being reviewed, this becomes a reality and not remain a dream. And ultimately, the taxpayers' money, which is all of our money, should be utilized properly, and there has to be accountability. Hence, the need of professional organizations who have the capability and the competency to deliver quality care and ensure the treatment outcome should be looked at seriously. I think uh, there are many other points to speak about, but I hand it over to you, Shambhavi. Uh, let's uh, discuss in the group. The other important points. Over to you, Shambhavi. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, for your valuable inputs. And we'll deep dive into these issues in the questions. Uh, now, I'd like to open the questions to the panel. I think the first key question that we should ask is, given the present end-stage renal disease burden in India, is the country prepared in terms of dialysis delivering capacity? And I'd like to direct this question to Vikram, sir, uh, to provide his, his inputs. Sure. Thanks, Shambhavi. Uh, I don't think India is ready to uh, meet the growing demand for dialysis. And one of the biggest hurdles there is human resources. Uh, machines, commodity, you can pay five, six lakhs, you can get the machines, right? But um, accommodating human resources like dialysis nurses, as Dr. Ashish said, dialysis technicians, the doctors, doctors and so on in the tier three, tier four cities. Now we all have to understand that everyone wants to live in the top 10 cities, right? From a lifestyle perspective, we all aspire to have a basic quality of life. And it's very normal for the nurses and the therapists and the MBBS doctors also to aspire the same. Now we should not blame them. The challenge is with all the focus going in the top 10 cities, the, the growing demand will not just be limited to top 10 cities. Top 10 cities are good for the excess or increase, uh, increasing demand, but the rest of the country is in abysmal shape. And I think this is where we need to invest heavily in creating the human resources over the next several years, wherein we have to invest now to help meet the demand in future. So I think from a Equip, uh, whether we are ready, we are not in human resources. We can easily buy equipment. Equipment is, it, you place an order, you will get it in two weeks. But human resources, you need to invest a few years in advance. That's one. Second, I think the government also has to uh, realize that from a percentage of GDP spend on healthcare, we are still not even 2% of GDP, right? If you look at BRICS, it's 6.7, 6.8%. Right. I'm talking about the average of BRICS, which includes India. But 2.2% 2, 2. 2 is a abysmal rate and government needs to spend a lot more on healthcare, on dialysis, so that that 15% scary metric that we see uh, of people who need dialysis getting access to dialysis. Yeah, we all as an industry, all of us, if, if it gets to 30% in the next five years, we would be super elated. But the government needs to take it as a priority to fund it. Once the funding comes in, once the human resources are in place, I think we will be better equipped. But right now, we are in, to be honest with the panel, we are in a tough situation at this point. Uh, I, I would love to hear Dr. Narula's views if he has any other 
the view on this. Right. Yeah. I would like to invite Dr. Narula. Thank you. Thank you. I, I agree with you. I don't think we are ready at all. Uh, I'm happy you brought out the uh, question or the answer on human resources. Besides nephrologists, besides technicians, besides dialysis nurses, the entity which Ashish spoke about, we must understand that we need good service backup for these machines. There is no point in having a machine and not having a good service backup. I have seen machines lying waste because we could not get the service engineers. So we need to have a good human resource towards this. That is one aspect. The other aspects I think we have to look into is education. We need to have people educated, both the clientele educated as well as the doctors educated on the delivery of dialysis to our patients. It's only then that we are going to move forward. And last but not the least, the affordability. Are our population or is our population ready to spend the money that we say it requires to do good dialysis? If you look at the amount that the government or the insurance company spends on dialysis, I had some figure somewhere which said it amounts to less than 30% of the actual cost of a good effective dialysis compared to 80% being spent in the Western world. So taking all these factors into consideration, I think we still need some way to go before we can have dialysis for all. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Uh, Sharma, would you also like to add, are we ready in terms of even the machines and the equipment? So I'll, the slightly, so I'll slightly reduce the embarrassment with due permission from all the families. So Sharma, we even, and any country globally is actually not prepared to give a 100% dialysis to all the patients. So this is one thing which I would like to reduce embarrassment uh, saying that we are not prepared. Second part is that if you see, like Dr. Narula started, it was 1961 when the first dialysis started in India. And uh, we are here in 2022. And there has been a lot of evolution happening in this field. So, I mean, that also has to be, you know, to be available in this country. And coming on the point to be ready, this is a realization. And I'm happy that you now, at least we are realizing that we have to get ready. We are getting prepared. And I'll tell you that even there is a huge population which is left behind. But still, we have traveled a very, very, very tough time. You won't believe what was the dialysis scenario 10 years before or 20 years before. But yes, we have gone through that tough time. But it's still, it's still a... A, a big highway to travel. Maybe the road might be swift because you have the technology, you have the providers, but the length of the highway is pretty long. So apparently, as per se, we are not ready. But yes, we have the skills. India is one of the world's largest producer of doctors, engineers, scientists, businessmen. So if we can handle the world, why cannot we handle our own country? We can. We have the skills. We are having the, the, what we say, the force, which is willing to, you know, spend time, which is willing to invest for this country. And you can see one of the largest people, organizations in this panel who are there, Sportis Group, which is Metro Plus, Apex, Presenius, E&Y. So we have the capability. We are not ready, but we will be for sure. Thank you, sir, for your inputs. And uh, now that we know that there is a long way to go, it is important to understand the challenges that we face in providing quality care, dialysis care to the patients in India. And here I'd like to invite Indranil, sir, to give his initial remarks. What are the key important challenges uh, hindering the um, dialysis delivered to the patients? Uh we have to look at for a smooth dialysis delivery, what all are required. First is the machines, the dialysis machine, without which you cannot deliver. So as I said in the beginning, India does not manufacture machine. All machines are to be imported. Uh, so obviously that is definitely a challenge because it adds to the cost of the delivery.
The second is the dialysis consumables. Most of the important dialysis consumables are imported. There are only one or two factories where a very scant percentage of the total consumables used are being produced. And again, there's a cost. Uh, Vikram and Dr. Narula and Dr. Ashish pointed out regarding the manpower challenges. So that's another challenge, whether it is dialysis nurses, whether it is dialysis technicians, even physicians. Let us understand without naming certain states, there are large states in the country with large population where the number of nephrologists are very, very less. In fact, in the whole country, there are about only 2,600 nephrologists, whereas the requirement is much more. And even the physicians in the different government hospitals, they do not have adequate exposure to manage dialysis units. So those are the challenges. So lack of skilled manpower, machine and major consumables, the high cost of delivery of service because of many things being imported from outside. The lack of quality standards. I mentioned in the beginning that there are no mandatory standards. They, so that those are very uh, important things because there has to be a common minimum program as far as standards are required. There has to be accountability. There is no accountability and no set outcome goals which are defined. Hence, there is variability of services leading to fragmented market. And also, I will raise one more point at the end. I would come back to the point I had raised regarding the patient awareness and education. Because even if we see that the doctor has advised the patient twice a week dialysis, there are multiple instances where the patient is not willing to take three times a week. The patient is not willing to take four hours every day during every session of dialysis. So these are the challenges the industry is facing. And I will add another point, which is very, very critical. I, I feel and I'm sure uh, Vikram and Dr. Ashish will agree to that. Uh, today, a large portion of the dialysis industry is in the government landscape. And that's going to remain and probably is going to increase as we move ahead with One Nation, One Dialysis taking shape. So the government needs to be aware of the fact that dialysis is not an acute thing. It's a chronic means. Patients in our system in Apex, we have patients who are taking dialysis for the last eight years, 10 years, 12 years. And same is the case with many of our other, uh, uh, other organizations. So the point remains, it has to be a sustainable model. Now for the model to be sustainable, it need not be profiteering, but it must be that much of profit the organization sustains, the industry sustains. And the government needs to be cognizant of timely payments because if cash flows dry up and with most of the things to be imported with high duties, then it becomes very, very difficult for even large organizations to sustain the operation. Ultimately, who will be the loser? It will be the patients because the patient cannot afford to miss a single session, right? That can be life threatening. So the the timely payments from the different government schemes are critical. So in short, what the government uh, should do and what the industry is facing, I should say manpower, lack of skilled manpower. I should say machines and consumables being imported. That is a challenge leading to high cost of delivery. I should say lack of quality standards. That is a challenge leading to variability of services. That is a challenge. And I would say that uh, awareness and uh, you know education among patients as well as the government need to be more prudent and the government to be more sensitive towards making the models sustainable so that ultimately it benefits the patients. That's it. Thank you for my side. Right, sir. Uh, Vikram, sir, would you also like to add to these challenges? Yeah, I think Indranil has been fairly comprehensive. I, I would just like to add one point uh, which has been hitting the industry very hard for the last few years, which is inflation. So if you look at inflation, right, uh, uh, if you look at CGHS reimbursement, many of the price points that you see in the market, mm -hmm. CGHS has not revised dialysis pricing since 2014. It's been eight years. And we all live in the world of inflation. We all mm -hmm. see what's going on with the various inflationary pressures, right? From a dialysis industry perspective, there are three uh, ways in which inflation hits us. One is wage inflation, which is every year, in order to retain good clinical talent, we have to continuously provide uh, appraisals and increments to the clinical staff. And if the price point does not increase appropriately, 
it adds to inflationary pressure. Second is um, from a plastic inflation, plastic price. Whenever crude oil price increases, we all in the Dallas industry uh, sort of uh, get very frustrated, right? Because crude increases the plastic price, which increases all the consumables price, price points. So, and we have seen compared to previously 30 to $50 uh, per barrel price point, now it's hovering close to $100. And it's even projected in some scenarios to go to $175 uh, per barrel. Now mm. that plastic inflation, plastic cost inflation significantly mm. hits because consumables are the biggest cost item for dialysis service providers. The third thing that hits is API inflation. What do I mean by API inflation? We all in dialysis need to use heparin. And heparin, we were all reliant on Gland Pharma, which is one of the companies uh, in India. And suddenly Gland Pharma increased the API or the heparin pricing by two and a half times about mm -hmm. two years ago. Two and a half times, not 15%, not 20%, not 40%. Now that took a major um, that put a major burden on us because the price does not increase proportionately in India. As I said, many of the schemes, including CJHS for the last eight years, price is fixed. The Arugeshi scheme in Telangana, if the price point is fixed for the last 13 years. Can you believe it? Where is inflation 13 years ago? Where is the price point or cost price cost point? And where is the cost structure right now? So inflation in the last two, two three years has hit the industry very hard. And hence, it's important for the government to recalibrate the price points in CGHS, in various uh, public-private partnership projects as well. But rest all, I think, were beautifully covered by Indranet. Uh, thank you, sir. You've uh, very nicely pointed out the inputs that are actually going into the output delivery services and how these prices are rising of these inputs also. In this context, uh, I'd like to invite Dr. Sharma, if he would also like to speak uh, more on the imports versus domestic manufacturing uh, that we have right now. Yeah, thanks, Shambhavi. So um, uh, that was pretty impressive, at, uh, Vikram, like you said. So look, again, I will be, I'll showcase, I'll not showcase, I'm a proud Indian. So every Indian would be very happy to have things getting manufactured in this country, and that's a dream come true. But, so, but as a nephrologist, I'm also a part of a um, renowned organization which is both into manufacturing and servicing. I also know that it's not an easy job. It, 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 it requires a lot of you know, work which requires. And in that case, we see that, like Indranil said, uh, that most of the things uh, which are of quality standards are imported and that is a cost which is coming up because of the logistics. Now on that, if we have a custom duty coming up, that adds you know, to the things. And I'll copy what Vikram said that considering if inflation is happening without any price rise, but the custom duty and the price of the technology and consumables continues to rise. Now, if we do, if anybody is not getting any price raise, how anybody would sustain, number one. Second, I guess most of the good organizations have are determined to provide, provide quality and standardized dialysis to their patients. Nobody wants to cheat them. Now, if they, we want to do continuously on that frame, sustaining on the same pricing is not possible. So I believe that Yes, manufacturing is a dream come true. We have lots of international brands who are now in India. And I believe in coming future, maybe the dialysis giants also would be entering this current market. But in current scenario, when we are talking about future of dialysis in this country, sustainability of dialysis in this country, I believe there should be a, a kind of a time frame given to the organizations for this uh, manufacturing. And along with considering it as a life-saving treatment, I believe that that custom duty or whatever duty part comes up on the consumables and machines, it should be you know, relieved so that this would drastically reduce the cost of the treatment for the providers and out of the pocket spent from the patients. No, no, we have to take care of everybody. This is a family. 
and i will just give one example whether it is necropolis prigenius apex fortis or any other organization who are in healthcare industry each and every penny of their salary comes from the pocket of a patient right it's not coming from anywhere it's coming from the pocket of a patient even my salary is coming from the pocket of a patient maybe indirectly if we want to be very loyal to them we need to have a supportive hand from everybody including government and i guess as a nephrologist also as a part of the service and manufacturing i guess this is the pain point and if we are relieved with this and within a time frame which government should think that this should be a kind of a, a, a good time frame for setting up a manufacturing unit i believe india would be a much better place much much better place for patients for service providers for manufacturers for government for nephrologists i guess it's a win win uh thank you Amavi, yes one uh, <laughs> yes sir i think this point around sustainability is very important right and i would like to share one specific example on sustainability uh, as i mentioned in the telangana state the arugeshi scheme did not increase the price for 13 years and then uh, recently about 2 years ago they the payments from the state were also getting delayed by several several months like 15 months 18 months 20 months we had no choice but to shut down about six of our dialysis centers in telangana now we cannot cut corners because our brand equity brand reputation cannot be compromised but we'll shut down the capacity because as an organization as dr ashish said ultimately it needs to be sustainable right without appropriate price inflation without timely reimbursement that indranil brought about how will the service provider continue offering quality care on a sustainable basis it's it's simple economics it won't work out so companies reputed companies like ours on the panel will shut down capacity will never cut corners because reputation is involved and when you shut down capacity the patients are the ones who suffer the most just wanted to share that example uh dr narada would you like to add yeah, yeah i was listening very interestingly to what the industry has to say about the cost of dialysis and what are the cost of inputs and what was crossing my mind was that it is actually the patient who suffers uh, the dialysis provider has to cut down capacity uh the people who are paying whether it be the insurances or the central government health schemes they take their own time they don't suffer it is the patient who suffers so we have to find a way where the patient does not suffer and i can give you replete examples even where in fortis where i work where we make it a point that the quality is not compromised come what may even if we have to wait for months for payment we will not compromise on quality of care for our patients because that's what we are meant for that's what we are here for so this answer the panel has to give so dr narula i think we we had sent about uh, 45 representations to the stakeholders relevant stakeholders right and being a a, a private uh, service provider with a board of directors to respond to you can only stretch six Six months, twelve months, fifteen months. At some point, the thread will break, right? So, uh, expecting a, a private service provider to work uh, from a continuous uh, waiting for three years, four years for payments or inflation—it's just impractical, Doctor Nala. We are all—it pains us so much to shed capacity, but you—you you can imagine the. Concern. I entirely agree. I was speaking from a philosophical uh, point of view. Yes. Yes. That man who feeds us, he is the one who suffers the most. Yes, I totally agree. Totally. Agree. Um. So, in the interest of time, uh, let's uh, just talk about some very big questions. Um. The big question here is, what are the lessons that we can draw from the PMNDP program, and what should be the defining features of the One Nation One Dialysis program? And I'd like to open this to the panel. Uh, Mr. Indranil, would you like to provide your input? so uh, very interesting question the lessons for me while the pmndp program and the honorable prime minister and the ministry of health and family welfare and the able ministers and is officers are doing everything i would still say that it will be critical to measure the outcome 
again i come back to the point that it is the taxpayers money there has to be accountability so measuring of outcomes because see anyone and everyone can provide dialysis but is the patient survival getting prolonged and there are certain critical parameters which need to be measured now the question is measure how today almost all the established service providers have developed their indigenous software in which we enter the data and we have an automated dashboard to which we measure but the need of the hour is the data should actually flow seamlessly from the machines to the software and then to the pmndp portal for which we need a open system in which all the different types of machines in the country can actually be compatible so there should not be any restriction into that system that open system is a necessity and what will happen while the government has started working on some something like this for patient portability the government is yet to look at the quality as a parameter assessment which should be the uh, the future it should be it must come in and may most interestingly with a large population like our country and a large disease burden just imagine if we can fix this piece then what type of data we would be able to generate and how much future research can happen on this and what benefits it can be bring to esrd patients as we move into the future so the lessons are in my view there has to be outcome measurement there has to be proper assessment of service providers who will run this program as we discussed all the panelists discussed and uh, what should be the defining moment the defining moment should be the data moving in from the system to the from the machines to the system seamlessly open system and then work is being done not only the reviewing the clinical parameters but also research work being done on that of course we had enough of discussion on the payments on the economics so i'm not breaking it in here though as i as i say that uh, as vikram mentioned uh, let's be practical it remains a very serious price point we want to do good we want to provide uh, dialysis in as much centers as much possible but we do, we will never never cut corners so the government should be very serious about the sustainability of the model so that the access can really be good. that is what i have to share thank you from the over to you um when we are talking of one nation one dialysis let us not forget peritoneal dialysis also uh, and i'd like to uh, ask dr narula on this how can we increase the uptake of peritoneal dialysis treatment in india and what are the key roadblocks hindering the growth of this treatment uh, thank you now that's a very very difficult question to answer because uh, peritoneal dialysis despite being uh, years ahead of hemodialysis you know when we started dialysis it was always with the peritoneal dialysis and subsequently we got the dialysis machines and it became a second country cousin to hemodialysis i think one of the biggest challenges of making peritoneal dialysis the dialysis of choice or the first dialysis is the cost of peritoneal dialysis like i think uh, mr vikram mentioned that it is not manufactured in our country if you are going to take it down to the doorstep of an individual you should have a supply chain right from manufacturing in the country to supplying to the patient you should have adequate storage facilities in fact when i mentioned about ration at the doorstep you see right from manufacturing the msps to the household to the storage grain grain stores down to the uh, person concerned to the free ration stores same way the peritoneal dialysis has to flow unfortunately that system does not exist of the dialysis fluid flowing down to the patient the second thing is the expertise in putting the peritoneal dialysis catheters gone are the days when we would use a hard plastic cannula on the bedside and do a blind puncture into a patient it is now a sophisticated ultrasound guided catheter insertion and in a place where there is no electricity most of the time how are you going to put in a catheter so the very purpose of the dialysis moving to the patient gets lost if the patient has to move to a bigger hospital for catheter insertion the third thing is the misinformation on peritoneal dialysis 
that it's it's a procedure which causes a lot of infections it's a procedure which is not suited for tropical countries you'll be surprised in countries like mexico countries like thailand countries like brazil a uh, peritoneal dialysis of the capd programs are very strong because they have strengthened their supply chain strengthened their manpower looking after peritoneal dialysis and at this stage, if we sort of split between hemo and peritoneal, we will not reach anywhere. We have not strengthened a hemodialysis program. And now we want to branch off into a peritoneal dialysis program. So let us first consolidate one program and then move to the other. Uh, thank you, Dr. Narula. And um, I think now we should uh, have a just, yeah, yes, just a quick point on the PD, right? Um, uh, I think we all need to be practical about the Indian reality, right? Which is the government PPP project is supposed to benefit below poverty line patient population, right? Middle class and upper uh, affluent class is spending for themselves. But if you look at the amount of storage a PD patient needs at home, it's impossible for any BPL patient to have that kind of storage. The supply chain is broken, the storage is broken. And interestingly, in our primary research, we have found that the, among the non-affluent patient population, there is a huge psychological uh, viewpoint that taking care into your own hands, you will be accountable, you will be responsible. Let the service provider, let the hospital, let the doctor take care of us. So considering the cost of PD, which is roughly 2x in most of the places in India, they, we again come back to the same point, right? Only 15% of people who need dialysis are getting it. First, let, let's increase that 15% to 30%. Then we can look at fancier modalities. We can look at more costly modalities, but let's use the taxpayer money very, very efficiently right now. And the HD program is the one that is the most efficient right now. And the, as Dr. Narula said, if you try to do too many things, it won't work. Let us first focus on one thing and build access with affordable, efficient taxpayer money spent. Let's increase the penetration first. That's just my view. Uh, allow me to add one point to what, because peritoneal dialysis is very close to all of our heart. And probably these two are not competitors. They are complement, they should complement each other as we move ahead. But as rightly pointed out by Vikram, the cost is somewhere 2x to 2.5x. So we, India is not a country with endless financial resources. No country has endless resources. So we have to make the most of it what we have. So at a cost of a peritoneal dialysis, the simple view is probably two patients can be given hemodialysis in the whole year. And that would increase the percentage of people who are taking, who actually require and are actually taking dialysis. That would increase many fold. So peritoneal dialysis is important. It must be looked at, but First, as Dr. Neruda rightly mentioned, let's strengthen one, then let's go to other. That's it. Uh, thank you, sir. I wanted to invite the entire panel for their uh, final quick remarks and more uh, in a forward thinking direction. How can we make India a leader in the global dialysis space? And we can start with Vikram, sir. Sure. Uh, thanks, Shambhavi. I think um, India has the lowest price point for dialysis in the world. And that has equipped us um, to be very efficient because that's not a, uh, that's a necessity to survive in the Indian dialysis market, right? And what we have realized lately in the last three years is with all the experience that we have gained, uh, we currently run 305 centers uh, across 185 cities in four countries. So we have taken the India model we went into Philippines. We currently operate about 11 centers, which we are doing an acquisition that will take us 21 centers. And we have implemented our efficient operational framework, procurement framework, and we are making an impact there. We entered in a large contract in Uzbekistan with the Ministry of Health, where we have used the India efficient model to lower the price point of dialysis in Uzbekistan from $80 before us to $55 with us. So the 80 to 55, if you think about it, $25 per treatment is a huge saving for the taxpayer, right? So the taxpayer is happy. The, then there is accountability of clinical outcomes. So we have to publish the clinical outcomes. Nepal, we have two very large centers. So India 
I think the dialysis service providers in India who are focused on quality are uniquely positioned to make a huge global impact. And we believe that this is just a beginning. In the next 10 years, you will see many of us present uh, expanding into 10 to 15 countries globally. And India, Indian service providers are very, very capable to export this model and make huge impact. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Dr. Sharma, your remarks. So I'll be very quick. I guess uh, we, I believe, uh, I just said that uh, if we have the capacity of the world's largest pool of talents, so we are already in that league of world leaders. We just need to win that race. And uh, considering the experience holded by the service providers, the metrologists, and the manufacturers in this country, if we get a hand holding by the government, understanding by the population, I believe that day would not be very far where we would be in the counting of the world leaders for any renal replacement therapies. So I believe the race is already gone. Vikram already said it. And the people sitting on this panel are representing um, leaders in this, uh, uh, in this category. So I guess uh, we are we have already started and it's a journey. So once we have started, we will for sure take care of that journey. But yes, it's a hard work for everybody. It's not an easy job. We have to do that. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sharma. Dr. Narula, your vision for India? Yeah, so I was uh, sort of contemplating when I heard Vikram, Ashish and Indranil talking on how can we become world leaders in dialysis? I think we need to divide this into different compartments. When we want to become world leader in dialysis, we can have the make in India. And then we become world leader as far as the infrastructure goes, equipment goes, and we start exporting it. We start making fluid and we start importing it. That is one way. Uh, that is beyond this panel. But what is in this panel is the quality of dialysis. It's the quality of dialysis is what this panel of uh, all the leading dialysis providers are here. This is what they are focusing on. So if they have to export the quality of dialysis into the neighboring countries. Now, when you look at the quality of dialysis, say in the United States, and look at the quality of dialysis in India, there is actually a difference between the quality of dialysis. Although the same dialysis providers are even operating there, for example, Fresenius, they are operating there, they are operating in India, but there's a difference in quality. So they need to standardize their quality and export that quality. And along with this export, they have to be able to train the manpower, the specialized manpower. Now, who is the king of dialysis? It's actually the dialysis nurse. It is not the nephrologist. It is not the technician. It is the dialysis nurse. You have something known as the anemia nurse looking after uh, people on dialysis. The patients don't go to doctors there for months together. So this is what they have to export. The intellectuals have to be exported to countries where they are running dialysis. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Naruga. And finally, uh, Indranil, sir, uh, your final input. Yeah, I mean, Vikram uh, spoke about the overseas plans of expansion, which many of us are having. Dr. Ashish also spoke about, and Dr. Narula spoke about the manpower. Now, when we are looking ahead, uh, I mean, obviously, we have to be very, very optimistic as we look ahead. I will again come back to the point that the large population of India, nowhere else is there. Large GSRD population, nowhere else is there. We just need to fix this piece of data management. Data is gold mine. If we capture the data in the right manner and if we utilize the data, this can obviously bring in a sea change. It can bring in a dramatic change in the dialysis treatment, not only in this country, but all over the world. And that is how we can impact the dialysis treatment globally and make India a global leader. Of course, the points no, uh, pointed out by all my fellow panelists are very, very important. But from my side, I think this also should be looked at. Thanks. So, uh, Shambhavi, thank just, just yeah. one in 15 seconds. Uh, with uh, Mr. Nidhrini talking about data, I guess Dr. Narula will agree and everybody. The first thing we need to start is 
uh, India Renal Registry. We still are speculating, making kind of things, thought that this is actually 15% are getting, but actually we don't know. On paper, nobody can write it down. Vikram said it, if I ask Vikram, can you give it in writing? No, I can't give it in writing. The first thing is we need to know our patients. The first thing is to start the renal registry, to know what is the incidence and prevalence of CKD, what stages are in incidence and prevalence, and then ESRD. Along with the you know, clinical data output, that is, I guess, we need to do it now. It is the time. Thank you. Can I have a last rejoinder to this? You know, uh, some many, many years ago, the Indian Society of Nephrology started the registry to record how many patients are on dialysis and CKD stages. It took off for about six, seven months, and then it just sort of petered off because it's a lot of effort. But now here, there are the three panelists who are running huge dialysis centers. They are the ones who should be collecting data on patients on dialysis and collating it. Like Indra Neil said, data collection, data collection. Yes, but all of you have different data collection systems. Why don't you all get together and get the data together? You all are here. You all, all know we want it, but then why don't we meet and make that data symmetrical for all dialysis providers? Very good point. In fact, uh, we have created a dialysis service providers association, Dr. Yeah, Narula. And uh, essentially, all the large service providers in India, uh, we have formed an association, in fact, and we are all syncing up on many of these aspects. And one of that is how do you combine disparate data sets into a, into a coherent sort of a basic common minimum program data set, which will help us publish the registry. The, the matter of fact, Dr. Narula, We have to think out of the box. We have to come up with creative solutions to, to replicate the US RDS system. In US, Medicare will mandate, okay, US RDS, let's uh, spend about $20 million. In India, who will spend $20 million? Yes. We have to create it ourselves using indigenous methods. The price point is very different. Dr. Ashish will not get the same, uh, same modalities in India because the price point is less than 115 in India. So we have to come up with our own solution. We have to be the solution. US is not the solution for India. We have to be the solution for the developing world. And we have started that through DSPI. DSPI, yeah. yeah. No, very good point, Dr. Narula. Thank you. Uh, a big thank you to all the panelists. Uh, this was a very interesting and insightful discussion. I'd like to uh, invite Anugraha now to advise us on how to take this forward. Thank you, Shambhavi. I guess uh, one hour was not enough. I think we should have taken more time to do this. But then um, I think I should thank everyone here all experts present here for taking out time for this expert session. I personally learned a lot from this session and uh, I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to all the speakers and uh, especially you Shambhavi for moderating the session. And I would like to thank uh, Natal's leadership for their guidance and support for making this a success. Our uh, uh, partners for the session who are manning this show, AVNV and Health Biz Insights, for uh, making this, uh, uh, you know, any error free. And I, I would like to say uh, a happy Diwali and a safe weekend ahead to all of you. And uh, let's connect for another session soon. And we will be connecting next week, same time, same uh, day for another exciteful expert session. Thank you, everyone, once again, and have a happy Diwali and a safe Diwali. Thank you. 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 Thank you.